My name is Vidya Gopalakrishnan <coughs> and my call sign is Kilo, the number 4, Victor Golf Kilo. I'm super excited to be here with this tiny idea. But first let me introduce myself. I am an engineer but I write. What does that mean? By education, I am a communication and signal processing engineer. I worked at Motorola Solution as an LT, public safety communication system test engineer. But people around me always said I have a flair for tech writing looking at my project and lab reports. I used to laugh it off, but when the opportunity came to write for an amazing company called the MathWorks for their RF and antenna software, I jumped at it and I have never looked back. In the free time, I am the mother of a feisty four-year-old and also love to dance. <coughs> but I am sure you guys are not here to talk about me. Let us see how I got into this project. I did dabble in some projects for the Adler Planetaria to rig up a two-way communication system for their high-altitude pulse. But once I got to Boston for the writing job, I have not been very successful in volunteer work. I have tried to start. ORI was introduced to me by Open Lunar. I signed up for a research assist to search assistant program for the Open Lunar and was interviewed. Needless to say, I didn't make the cut, which told me about the huge amount of technology that I've lost touch with while writing. Open Lunar introduced me to Michelle Thompson and Open Research Institute. And when she spoke to me first, she asked me what I would like to do. I told her something tiny that is easy to manage with the many hats I wear in a day. And I believe she took me literally because you will understand when you walk through this. This is exactly also when I decided that I need to get an amateur radio license. In the beginning, I would ask Michelle what is the point of a project. When she explained it to me that a beacon to test expand receivers would be an amazing um, addition um, to the amateur radio community, it, it completely made sense to me. My mission, if I accomplish it, will be an expand beacon in space where everyone can test their expand receivers. So, how do we get this to space? That's where all this tiny comes in. Let's shift path a little bit. What if we can launch a satellite into space that is programmed by us? Space is no longer for governments as shown by Jeff Bezos and Virgin Atlantic. But they do not need to be for multi-billion dollar corporations. Ambisat just helps people like us touch the vastness of space because they have designed a tiny satellite. This project includes me, Michelle Thompson, and Dr. Alan Johnston, who is a professor at Villanova University. He has been using ambicides in high-altitude balloon launches for their past three or four launches. How will this tiny satellite get to space? It uses an ambicide launcher or CubeSat, which is 10 cm by 10 cm by 32 cm. This launcher can launch up to 200 of these tiny satellites. When the satellite, these satellites are based on spring loads stacks inside the CubeSat. On reaching, reaching LEO or low Earth orbit, a radio transmission will be sent to the ground, which will uh, uh, send from the ground, which will ask to release these satellites. So, why a low Earth orbit? LEO or low Earth orbit is relatively close to it, as we all know. It lies between 160 kilometers an orbital time of 90 minutes and 2000 kilometers which is an orbital time of 120 minutes. To maintain stable orbit in this region of space, satellites need to have an orbital velocity of 7.8 kilometers per second. Most of the human missions to space take place in this orbit except of course the moon landings and also the International Space Station conducts its operations from this orbit. The Ambisat satellite will be at a distance of about 230 kilometers and an orbital velocity of 7.8 kilometers per second. Meaning that our tiny little satellite will revolve around the Earth about 16 times a day. Ambisat will stay in orbit anywhere in between 3 weeks to 3 months. It depends on a lot of factors including drag and the altitude. What are the advantages of LEO? There is a shorter orbital period, latency of data sent and received is lower, launch costs are much lesser, lower RF power budget and better frequency reuse. 
Some challenges are it covers much lesser region. More atmospheric dark due to the thermosphere being close to it. The satellite will travel too fast so at times it will be difficult to detect or very little time to test it and it might need to establish line of sight with the expand. Like I mentioned earlier, the ambisat can stay in orbit from 3 weeks to 3 months maybe and even though this is an advantage, in one way as it would not create space debris as much, the disadvantage is that we do not have much time to test our expand receivers or any receiver for that matter. So, let us look at this layout. PCB layout of an ambassade. I'll show you the actual unit, but please look at, uh, please look at the uh, screen as well because what I have is really tiny, and what is on the screen is not up to scale. So this is ambassade. This is what it looks like. This has an a, a lot of things on it for a tiny satellite. It is an 8-bit microcontroller with a 32-bit flash memory a voltage regulator, a triscope, a gyroscope and an accelerator, accelerometer and a magnetometer, a 4 megahertz crystal resonator and you can choose from six different sensors. I have a UV sensor but you also can have a humidity and temperature sensor, a just temperature sensor, ambient light, gas pressure, temperature sensor, carbon emissions, GPS, etc. The sensor you choose, you can solder it on on your own or they will solder it and give it to you if required. The satellite can be powered using solar cells or batteries. If it is earthbound, it is batteries and if it is um, space bound, then you can, you, you, it's better to use solar cells. The satellite my <coughs> program comes with a programmer, programmer and the data can be received on the Amazite dashboard. But the star of course is the LoRa band transceiver and why we would like to change it. So what is LoRa band? LoRa band stands for Low, Low Power Wide Area Network. This network is most popular in connecting IoT or Internet of Things. Basically, it is machine talking to machines using the Internet. The frequency used by LoRa in North America is 950 MHz. And this is free. That means you don't need a license to use it. The maximum transmitted is 15 dBm and the transmission rate is very low, which is 250 Mbps or up to 50 kbps per second. Even because with all these drawbacks, LoRa standard is supported by many big alliances like <coughs> Cisco, HP, Bosch to name a few. LoRaWAN network is similar to cellular network. LoRaWAN devices communicates to central location of the gateway. The gateway is a go between between the sensor and the network server. Our tiny satellite, the ambisites are capable of transmitting data to over 5000 earth based TTN or things networks which are spread all over the globe. Now let us see why we want to change this or piggyback this using a microwave band beacon. Microwave band. Using microwave frequencies are authorized to all modes and licenses. Let us quickly go through the chart before we get into the details. As we go higher in the bands, the throughput is also higher and the antennas may get smaller but we will require line of sight. The spectrum band is larger. For example, the car band extends from 26 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz, but it is more susceptible to rain fading. The frequency ranges which we are talking about is the X band and the C band. Allocated to image radio is 5.6 to 5.9 gigahertz for the C band and 10 to 10.5 gigahertz for the X band. These frequencies are in line with modern communications and also provide the ability to send and receive data at high speed. So what are the advantages? Larger bandwidth, higher gain, higher directivity, you can transmit audio, video and data simultaneously. Smaller antennas, smaller <coughs> microwave um, components, low cost because of that, low power consumption. And what are some of the disadvantages? Line of sight is required most of the time, feeding due to atmospheric conditions such as rain, snow, fog, large number of reflections by flattened metal surfaces and it, it, the signal can also be diffracted by solid objects. Now that we have understood what we are trying to do with this project, let us take a look at a simple link budget analysis. 
Let us see the basic analysis of the system. We will compare the link budget and the received power and the carrier to noise density ratio of LoRa, Van and XMAN. Please do bear in mind that because this is a working problem, the values are just approximate. We will look at the basic link budget analysis. I know we all are familiar, but a quick review. This will help us understand how we have modified it to include the Doppler effect. The calculation is completely based on the reference paper and the reference paper is linked in the last side last slide of this presentation. Effective isotropic radiated power is the transmitted power added to, to the transmitted antenna gain minus the feeder loss. This is in dB. Total transmission path loss or TPL is free space path loss, polarization loss, atmospheric loss and tropospheric attenuation. And these are just some of the losses that I have added over here. Receive power or the link power budget is the EIRP minus the total transmission path loss or TPL and the receiver feeder loss. You can also add the satellite antenna gain divided by the system noise temperature to this part. I don't have some of the values, so this is again just an approximation. Last is carrier to noise density. It is a ratio of performance of a satellite link. It is a ratio of carrier power to noise power. It is adding all the gains and then subtracting the pass losses and the system temperature. Here we will look at the downlink value though the total value is the carrier noise ratio up carrying to noise ratio density uplink as well as downlink. Now we will look at the Doppler frequency shift. We are modifying these equations. We are going to consider the losses due to Doppler frequency shift in these equations. One of the problems of EO satellites is that the signal travels from Doppler shift due to the relative motion between the Earth's terminal and the satellite. As we all know, because of the shift, there is a change in observed frequency. <coughs> now, this equation consists of, uh, you can see the frequency Doppler shift depends upon the velocity of the satellite, the radius of the Earth, the transmitting frequency, coverage angle, the speed of the electromagnetic wave as well as the relative distance between the satellite and the Earth terminal. I have assumed a coverage of 13 degrees for this calculation when you look at the values. So this is how the receive power of the link power equation changes. Now we have two kinds of losses, the loss due to the total power, the total path transmission loss as well as the loss due to the frequency shift. All the calculations are in dB. And this is how the carrier noise density, carrier to noise ratio density also changes when you add the modified one. These are the values that I have received after the calculations. As you can see that there is a considerable change. <coughs> this is a work in progress so the amplification has not been added. Please keep in mind I have considered a coverage of 13 degrees which might not be true for a tiny satellite like ours. In such circumstances, you can see that there is a very large difference between the received power as well as the carrier to noise ratio in both LoRa 1 and XPAN from classic to modified, which is, therefore if you are going to use a modified, which is what we would consider using when you actually want to calculate the link power budget for correct values, we will need amplification. For me, one of the biggest and the hardest parts of this project was finding the right paths to suit my need. First and foremost, while building a career in writing, I had lost touch with the advances in communication and technology. Even a link budget analysis, which is quite easy, took some time for me because of the years that I have lost touch with this. And of course, life got in the way. When Dr. Johnston and Michelle spoke to me about this project, I was very excited. But after some thought, I was completely clueless what I can use to make this a reality. Even after a couple of months, I hadn't gotten a little better. As you all can understand, the size of the satellite and the power available is very less. While I was wrapping my head around this, I came through lots of paths. The thing about these paths, the thing about uh, these paths that we are looking for for a beacon is that most of these chips. W chips are not for microwave, they are for Wi-Fi, so why can't we repurpose these chips? You will see. The first chips as you can see is microchip 1 MD1370. This is an 8 channel ultra low channel, 8 channel ultra low CW 
transmitter with a beam former it's a good option the second chip is a texas instrument tfp7769 it is a quad channel after transmitter with a feedback loop frequency of operation and the third one is an is an analog devices chip adar2001 it is a frequency multiplier and filter and works from 10 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz all of the above works but if you look at my satellite and the size of it and the amount of power these are all chips that would require a huge power and huge space to actually accommodate it so when i showed this to michelle she said we can use this for terrestrial communication but we need to look for something better for the ambisat and that's how i came across a paper I will not take credit for this amazing piece of work, but once I figured this out, I noticed that there are many people and many communities who are using this particular unit to create a chip to create an X-band beacon. What am I talking about? The paper I came across, I have linked it again in the section below after this presentation. Let us take a look at what this is. This is HP hundred. Again, this is not to scale. I got this motion sensor about six dollars from Amazon, and it is widely available. And it is a 10 gigahertz or 10.5 gigahertz Doppler radar transceiver. This is what he repurposed it to look like. So, consists of an HP hundred, an LM7805, which is a voltage regulator, an SMA connected power source, and tools. A switch in our case, not sure if we will need this. A microwave sensor HP hundred, HP hundred is a part of a short range motion detector. The motion uses a dielectric resonator as a signal generator. This motion sensor is designed for ten point five to five, which is a little above the frequency that we can use in the X band. But this is allows tuning to desired frequency of ten point three six nine gigahertz. The DRO. Can be connected to an XMA connector, which will be used to connect to a transmit antenna. The power source we require is a 12 volt supply, which we can use the LM7805 to reduce it. 05 to uh, as a voltage regulator to bring down it to about uh, 5 volts, right? And that is a maximum supply voltage that HP100 can handle. The signal generator radiates to space. And the antennas are part antennas on this side of the HP hundred. There is transmit antennas and receive antennas. So it is a transceiver basically. And we can also tune this by using the metal screw over this and tuning it. There are many Facebook communities that use this in different ways to generate a signal or even in the receiver to test a signal. So my idea is to use this circuitry to piggyback or create a beacon generator for Ambisat. These are some of the references that I have used to come up with this presentation. Please excuse me if I have said anything that is mistaken or wrong in this presentation, and please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions or any suggestions or any corrections in my presentation. I am all ears. Thank you so much.